I love what I, I feel in this house right now. And I, I know it's nothing, nothing new to us to be in the presence of God where he just saturates us with his glory. And what I feel right now is confirmation for what the Lord put on my heart for today. I love the Lord. <laughs> Oh, I love the Lord. And as we go into this next, next part, if I can quest something of all of us. God's not entirely done yet. And if we would maintain what it is that we have right now until he takes us through this next part. Let's not go into this next part and say, okay, well, that portion of the service is done. All right, I'm going to sit back and relax now. But let's maintain what it is that we're feeling right now, what it is that we're hungry for right now, what it is that we're going after right now. Let's continue to seek that out and seek that through even as the word goes forth. I wish I could just like move and the Lord could just do his thing. <laughs> oh. I, I just one more time. Can we all just just one more time? You don't have to stand just in our seats wherever we are right now. Let's just let the Lord whisper to us right now. It's kind of an odd thing to say. But I wonder if we would just all close our eyes for just a moment. And let the Spirit of God just, just move. I can share something from my own experience, my own walk with God. Reference was made to first word about adding faith to thy will be done. And last Sunday, the word was taught about seek to understand than be understood. And there are moments, if I can share, <laughs> when we go to God, even in prayer, where it's okay, it's all right to just take a seat and say, Lord, I won't say a word, but I want, I, I want, it, I want to feel where you are right now. God, I won't say a word, but Lord, help me to understand what you're wanting to do right now. God, I won't say a word, 
but for just a moment, give me your eyes. And that's why I asked if we would all just close our eyes and just let the Lord whisper. Because it's okay to have those moments to just say, Lord, I won't say a word, I won't make a request. But I just want to be where you are right now. Not in my own world, but in your world. Exodus chapter 26. Starting at verse 31. And while you're turning or finding your Bibles, I'm going to try to not put y'all to sleep. I know I speak softly sometimes, but I'm going to try to not make y'all fall asleep. But as you're turning there, before I go any further, First, I just want to thank the Lord, thank God, because <laughs> he's so good and so faithful and so wonderful. I can't express enough how much I love the Lord, but also I, I know they're not here, but I, I want to give honor to our wonderful man of God, our pastor, and his wonderful lady, sister pastor or sister mom. And give honor to Bishop and Sister Bishop. <laughs> Sister Carnley in the back. I give honor to all of them. And I've said it before, and you will hear it every time I'm back here, that uh, as a reminder to myself that I stand here in submission to the man of God and to the Lord himself. But I don't want to say anything that is outside of the will of God, and outside of the vision of the man of God. But I want to be in line with both of those. Um, and let this also be my opportunity to put in my disclaimers. <laughs> that as this word goes forth today, I, I, I truly sincerely pray that it would be spoken with the love of God and that would emanate the love that our pastor has when he preaches. When he preaches, he preaches with such a love. And I'm not pastor, and I'm not going to try to be pastor by any means. But I, I want, I want <laughs> to operate in, in that same anointing that he has and that love that he has. And I hope that that's how it's received today. Exodus 26, starting at 31. Oh, my bad, I didn't give you scriptures. My bad. <laughs> and thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen of cunning work with cherubims shall it be made. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shinam wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tashes that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. Bishop, if you would please listen to prayer, and if we would all join Bishop just for one, one more time, if we would just seek the Lord and ask the Lord to to guide <laughs> these next few minutes.
Amen. Amen. Exodus 26. You guys may be seated. I'm sorry. (laughs) For the last few weeks, um, the Lord has been speaking to the church. And, of course, the Lord has been speaking to this church a lot longer than the last few weeks. <laughs> but for the last few weeks, I don't know if you guys have noticed a pattern, but um, I, I, I certainly have. With the word that God has laid on his oracles. If I can just really kind of recap some of the words if you can give me a timer, that would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> a few weeks ago, Brother Tim taught on fasting. Um, the kind of focus point of his message was that fasting brings us back into alignment with the Holy Spirit. And he mentioned something that I want to also mention again today, that when we fast for an earthly reward, we will gain just that. But when we fast for a heavenly reward, an eternal reward, we will also gain just that. Last week, and actually fasting, he spoke about that over two weeks. (laughs) And then last week, he spoke on seek to understand, then to be understood talking about a place in prayer where we exercise not just to pray our will, but to pray, thy will be done. It's the place in prayer where we recognize and go before God and say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. About praying God's will. On a Thursday, I believe, Two weeks ago, Bishop gave a wonderful word that I hope we were all listening. (laughs) What do you want? What do you want? And I just recap a few things that Bishop mentioned in that message. And I won't quote this exactly. But some of the things he said were, you can't satisfy a spiritual need with something physical. There's a place in God where he will give you whatever you ask for. And then later in the message, he stated that that place in God is in worship. Many are searching for a what, knowing that what they need is a who. God will never tell somebody, that's close enough, don't come any closer. I loved that, by the way. I heard that, and I said, hold on now, wait a minute. There's so much more that we haven't tapped into. And then on Thursday, last, this, I guess this past Thursday, for the Dion talked about the believer. But every word that was spoken really set the stage, in a sense, to what the Lord had been doing in me and talking to me about. And if I can repeat that one phrase that Bishop said, that God will never tell somebody that's close enough, don't come any closer. That's the heart of today's message. And today, I want to just briefly talk to us all about beyond the veil. Beyond the veil. When I was talking to the Lord, or the Lord talking to me with both of them, and I, I kind of, I, when I, I don't know about y'all, but sometimes when God talks to me, uh, gives me a concept, a principle, or teaching me something, I, I, I tend to ask the Lord, God, can you show me or give me something in your word that 
that explains what it is that you're trying to get me to understand right now. And I know I haven't exactly revealed it yet. We'll get there. But the Lord was like, go look at the tabernacle. All right. The tabernacle that we see in the Old Testament. Today we don't worship in a tabernacle per se. Uh, but the tabernacle that God gave Moses the instructions for is a type and shadow in a lot of ways for our New Testament life. And so for just a few, mo few minutes, I just want to take us through the tabernacle. I won't touch on everything. It's just a summary. But when you're entering into the tabernacle, the first place that you get to before you can go in is the gate. Is that image up there? Oh, appreciate you. You're so good at this. <laughs> The first thing that you get to is the entrance, the gate. And what's amazing about the tabernacle and the plan, the tabernacle plan that the Lord laid out, is that there's only one entrance into the tabernacle. There aren't five different ways of getting in. There isn't like this door and then like a little side door. You can't just like hop, over the, hop the fence and get in. There's only one entrance into the tabernacle. In the same way, that believe it or not, y'all, there's only one way to heaven. <laughs> but there's only one entrance into the tabernacle. And then when you walk through the tabernacle, the first item that you get to is the brazen altar. And the brazen altar, this is where the, the sacrifice was made. This is where the, the priest made his sacrifice. So there was bloodshed there. You can consider this as being similar to or synonymous or symbolic to when we start to enter a relationship with the Lord, a relationship with God, we have to, we, we, we praise the Lord, but when we come in, there's that point where we have to make some sacrifices to God that we often call repentance. There's some bloodshed there. This is the place where we say we, we kill the flesh. The brazen altar. And as we continue, we get past the brazen altar, the next thing we see is the brazen laver or the laver of water. I don't know if you can follow that over there. Maybe. Yeah, it's right there. <laughs> Looks like a pool. That one. But the brazen la laver, this is where the priest would wash his hands and his feet because he could not enter into the next part of the tabernacle without first being clean. Um, and as a matter of fact, the priest, before he was consecrated or part of his consecration, um, had to be completely washed. Completely washed. We'll get there. But... At the laver, the priest would wash his hands and would wash his feet. And you can think of this as the waters of baptism. Before we can get to the next place in God, we need to be baptized in Jesus' name. That's his cleansing of us. At the altar, we sacrifice ourselves. When we get to the water, he washes us clean. So this is the outer court of the tabernacle. The, the first things that we've just listed are, are things that are visible to everyone, that anybody around can see this. It, you don't have to, like, climb up to the fourth level or climb in a tree to see this. This is open to everybody, and everybody can see this part of the tabernacle, the open court. But then as you continue into the tabernacle, then things become a little bit more hidden in a sense. And as you go in, there's another door, another entrance that you go through. And when you go through that entrance, you are now in the holy place. And in the holy place, there were a few items there. There was the golden candlestick, which provided light. There was the table of showbread, which had 12 loaves of unleavened bread for the high priest and his sons to eat, and the altar of incense. The golden candlestick, that's 
That's light. It's bringing light. That's what Jesus is to us. He's the light of the world. The table of showbread is significant of provision. He's the bread of life, we know. We know that he is our provider. And we know that the word, which he is, is our bread. There's provision in the holy place. And in the holy place, there's the altar of incense. And the altar of incense, I've always understood is symbolic to our prayers. There's prayer in the holy place. Psalm 141, verse 2. I'm sorry. I didn't give it to you. Psalm 141, verse 2 says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Revelation 8, 4 says, And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. The altar of incense is prayer. And if I could just pause for one moment. We've talked about the importance of prayer so much, um, but it just, it just changed something in me when I understood that when I go before God and I pray that God receives that as a sweet scent. That when we pray that our prayers go up to heaven as a sweet odor, as a sweet savor. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to just be me, okay, for myself. I'm going to just be me for a moment. Listen. <laughs> Doesn't that make prayer just a little bit more beautiful for you? It certainly does for me. That when we go to God, that God cherishes our prayers. That God wants us to go to him in prayer. That when we go to God in prayer, the Lord is like, ah. Mm. Ladies, think about when you receive flowers, for example. What's the first thing you do? Think about when, like, you, someone, you put on a, you get a new perfume. Is that how you say that word? Yeah. <laughs> or guys, you put on that nice cologne, hoping that, that your wife, spouse, or some lady person you have a crush on would just, <sighs> because it's pleasing, right? That's what our prayers are to God. Our prayers are pleasing to the Lord. And then, once we leave the holy place, this wonderful, wonderful <laughs> holy place where we have just about everything we need at this point. If you think about it, we have the provision, we have the light that we need. We, have, we can talk to the Lord. We, we have just about everything that we need at this point. But that's not where the tabernacle ends. There's more beyond that place. There's more beyond the holy place. Um, and many of us know that there's a, a veil there. Like, oh, that is loud. Praise God. Sorry. I said I was going to be myself. That's, that's just me. <laughs> And there's a place like we read in Exodus beyond the holy place. And the thing that separates the holy place and that other room is a veil. Um, and anytime I, I talk about the veil or I think about the veil, I think about when Jesus died on the cross and we know the veil was torn. Hallelujah, won't he do it? <laughs> Sorry, you can laugh. <laughs> The veil was torn. And what, what did that mean when the veil was torn? Access. It gave us access. It gave us access. Okay, hold on. I'm getting excited. Bring, bring it back. Bring it back. <laughs> but when that veil was torn, it gave us access to what was beyond the veil. See, here's why this is so important. Uh, oh, God is good. Whew. All right, y'all. Come. Wani will. I got to calm down. But here's why this is very important. See, what we don't realize is when Moses was given the plan for the tabernacle, it's not just anyone that could make it to the holy place. 
We could see what was happening at the brazen altar. We could see what was happening at the laver. We could see all of it. But it's not everyone that had access to it. It's not everyone that could go into the holy place and see that wonderful light. It's not everyone that can go to the holy place and eat of that bread. It's not everyone that could go into the holy place and partake of, and of that sweet incense and that sweet savor that was in that place. But only the priest could go in. And that room that was beyond the veil, that room that was beyond the holy place, only one could go there. And it was the high priest. And so when that veil was torn on that day, <laughs> I know I wasn't there, <laughs> but sometimes I envision that if I was, woo. <laughs> I want to run in. I, wait a minute. I could go. Oh, oh, hold on now. I want to run in. <laughs> That's what's so important about the, that veil being torn is because now you and I could go in. Because now you and I can see the things that we could. Uh. <laughs> <Woo>. Good Lord. <laughs> That now we could see the things that we couldn't see before. That now we can have access to the things that we didn't have access to before. And the thing is, I know that up to this point, this is probably something we've, we've all, at least I hope, that we've all heard before. We've all learned, maybe in Sunday school, maybe in preaching somewhere, maybe just in reading our Bible. We, we all understand that concept, that it was so important for that veil to be torn because when Jesus died on the cross, he was saying, I don't just want a select few to come to me, praise God. <laughs> but I want every single one of you to have access to me. What was beyond that veil? was the Ark of Testimony, or the Ark of the Covenant. And upon it sat the mercy seat. We know that on either side there were the cherubims. Sister Johnny, why are we talking about the tabernacle? Thank you for asking. I appreciate that. So that one for Brother Tim. <laughs> I'm glad you asked because I asked the Lord the same question. <laughs> and the thing is, the Lord was trying to get me to understand something, get to understand a concept that I hope we can all grasp today. I, I asked the Lord this question because I'm sure many of us have found ourselves to this place and have prayed this prayer or asked this question of the Lord. And actually, somebody today, Brother Corbin with a K, is wearing a shirt. What's on your shirt, Brother Corbin? Into the deep. And I was talking to the Lord, and, and I, I, listen, I like things plain and simple, okay? All right, like, give it to me plain, I'll get it. And I was asking the Lord, semi going a different direction. It's all right, keep up. <laughs> Y'all just stay with me, stay with me, okay? But I was, I, I was talking to the Lord, and, and the Lord was just kind of talking to me about the deep and into the deep. Um, I know that was the theme for youth this year and also the theme for United this year, the deep. And I know that as apostolics, that's what we're seeking for. That's what we're trying to get to, I think. <laughs> Is the deep. But then I asked the Lord because, you know, sometimes you got to ask the dumb questions. I said, Lord, what's the deep? Anybody else ever ask God that? I said, Lord, what, where is the deep? How do I find the deep? And I'm being so serious right now. This is really how I talk to God. <laughs> Because we've all prayed the prayer, Lord, I want to go deeper. Lord, take me deeper. What does it consist of? 
Yeah. God, take me deeper. Lord, I, 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 want, I want to go deeper. But where are we going? Where is the deep? Let, mm, praise God. Let's reference the scripture really quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter two, starting in verse nine. It says, "Buzz, oh, buzz." That's not what it says. <laughs> but as it is written, "I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him." But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea. The deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God know man, but the spirit of God. Verse 10 again. God hath revealed to them, revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, the deep things of God. I love the scripture, the deep things of God. It moves me. I'm like, oh, yes, Lord, the deep things. I want to go deep. But God, where is the deep? God, what is the deep? Lord, how do I get to the deep? And then that's when the Lord revealed it to me. We talk about going to the deep. We want to go to the deep. And the deep is that place beyond the veil. Because what was there? That ark of testimony. The ark of testimony, the ark of the covenant. We know, we know that God is omnipresent. Oh, I finally said it right. We know that God is omnipresent. You can't really contain God, but he allowed for his spirit to be in this box? Question mark? See, for the children of Israel, the Ark of the Covenant was, in a sense, the spirit of God. But only one man could access it. Only one person could have access to it. And, and, and I'm going somewhere, I promise. But when the Lord revealed to me that the deep is that place beyond the veil, I began to understand because, see, earlier I mentioned that in the holy place where you have the candlestick, you have the bread, and you have something else that I mentioned, praise God. <laughs> Thank you, incense. You could be content there. And the Lord was showing me that, Jorney, the reason why I'm showing this to you was because, unfortunately, the veil was torn. But too often, my people still make their way to me and they stop at the holy place. Because at the holy place, there's enough light and we can see. Because at the holy place, there's bread. We have provision. We're okay. We're going to make it. And at the holy place, ah, Jesus, there's that sweet incense. We can still pray to God. We can still have communication with God. At the holy place, you can be content. Ah, Jesus. Ah. Lord was revealing to me that I don't want you to just stop a holy place where you're secure and know that you have everything that you need and everything that you want. <laughs> He's saying, I want you to go beyond that veil 
and go to the place where you don't just get the things that you want or the things that you need or those requests that you can make known unto God. But I want you to go to the place where I dwell. The place beyond the veil. See, here's the thing. We, <laughs> oh, God, it's so good. <laughs> and, and I promise I'm, I'm not talking at you or trying to condemn anybody. I am talking to myself, really, I promise. Um, it was very convicting, actually, putting this together because I was like, well, Lord, okay. <clears throat> Ow. Um, because we can be good Christians. We can do all the right things. We can come to church and pray. <laughs> we can be good to our neighbors. We can serve. We can do all the right things and, and even have a relationship with God where we know that if we have need of something that he will make a way. Where we have faith. Absolutely. We can be at a place where we have all of those things but still not be in the deep. And still not be beyond the veil. But how do we go beyond the veil? I want to make a reference to another verse, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. A verse we all know. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood. <laughs> See, uh, when the Lord was talking to me, he, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like low-key the Lord be sassy with me. Um, maybe not sassy, but sometimes he just like, no mercy. I'm like, okay, wait a little softer but when the Lord was talking to me about this <laughs> we quote that verse and we like to identify as the chosen generation the royal priesthood the holy nation right all, all the things but the Lord was like Jorney do you know that there's a difference between the royal priesthood and the people That we can claim to be the priesthood, but the priesthood had a job to do. Let me put it to you this way. We can be <laughs> good children of God, experience the miracles of God, because the children of Israel did. Every time God did a miracle, they saw it. They experienced it. They were even a part of it. But there were things that they were not a part of. There were things that only the priesthood could do. Going to that place is one of them. We can quote this verse all day long. But the truth is, there was a difference between the people, or just the children of God, and the priesthood of the people of God. We can be good Christians. We can even be good apostolics. But God is challenging us to not just be good Christians and good apostolics and just the people of God. But God's actually challenging us to be in his priesthood. And so then I asked, Lord, what was it that separated and dis made a distinction between just the children of Israel? Because the children of Israel, they were chosen. They were set apart, right? They were set apart as we are. The thing that separated the people from the priesthood is not only the fact that there were Levites, But the thing that separated them was consecration. 
even for a Levite, even for the priest himself, if he wanted to make it any deeper into the tabernacle and come back out alive, (laughs) he needed to be consecrated. Before they could make it to the inner parts of the tabernacle, like we mentioned before, there was the washing of the hands and the washing of the feet before they could even make it to the holy place. Before they could go anywhere deeper in the closer inner parts, they had to be consecrated. There were requirements of them. And I'm not here to talk about rules or anything of that sort. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is God is wanting to take us somewhere deeper. And I know we've heard this phrase or expression before, but there are certain things that cannot go with us into the deep. See, what happened for the high priest is if he tried to go into the holy of holies, into that most holy place, without doing what the Lord had required of him to do, guess what? He did not come back out. He died. As we go into the deep, there are certain things that God is saying, this cannot go with you. But until we let go of those things, we won't have access to the deep beyond the veil. I've noticed, I I know this was probably, well not probably, this was my own experience for some time. If I can bring a little bit of clarity to what we're talking about today. Maybe this is not you, maybe it was just me. But sometimes there's this expectation and we put all the weight on the pastor, on the man of God, that you will go seek out the Lord and then bring it back to us. The children of Israel did that. Moses came back down from the mount. The glory of God was just all over him. And they were like, no, 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 no. We don't want any part of that. You go talk to God and then just come tell us what he says. That's what will separate us and not allow us to go to that most holy place. We have to get to a place where we don't just rely on pastor to go to that place and deliver the word to us on Sunday or on Thursday or whatever day of the week. But we need to get to a place where every single day of every week, we're seeking to go to that place. If you will stand with me. For the last few weeks... It's been spoken about, and the word has gone forth about fasting, the importance of fasting, and the importance of prayer. And I know I shared this before, but when Brother Tim was, um, (laughs) well, this happened before he shared. But I, I was in prayer with the Lord, and then Brother Tim shared with me what the Lord was putting on his heart to preach when he was gonna teach on fasting. And it connected for me and it clicked for me. That God was was telling me that when we fast, remember Jesus said, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. What the Lord was trying to get us to understand there is if we want to do those things like he did and cast out demons like he did and not just be part of the experience and view it from the outside, there are some consecrations that have to be done on our part. And what he was showing me is (laughs) that when we learn to do that, that when we get to a place where we choose to be consecrated, unto the Lord and we adhere to those even those convictions that he lays on our hearts that what we're allowing to happen is we're allowing ourselves to operate in God's dimension I'll put it this way if we're going to save our city we're not Jesus we're going to need to operate in his dimension 
We're going to need to operate in the place wherein he dwells if we're going to save the people of this city, the people of this state. When we go beyond the veil, the things that were there, (laughs) the high priest got to experience for himself the fullness of the glory of God and the angelic for himself. And that is what God is wanting us to partake of and calling us deeper into. That God is saying, come to where I am and I will give you the ability to operate in what I operate in. In my dimension. We're not, listen, we're, we're not going to do everything. We're not going to be able to accomplish thy kingdom come and thy will be done by our own means. We've been learning that. It's about thy will be done. And what is that thy will be done is we have to allow the Holy Ghost to operate and to move in us. That's what fasting does. That's what that kind of prayer, the kind, the kind of prayer that says, Lord, thy will be done, is the kind of prayer where we walk with God every day. This is going to sound a little silly, and, and somebody called me out on it yesterday. I, I barely remember what we're talking about, but I, we were talking about clothes, clothes, I think. And somebody said, you, and, I, and I said something about, yeah, I had to ask the Lord about that one. And they were like, you talk to the Lord about your clothes? Yes. Don't you? <laughs> it sounds silly, but here's what I mean. When we talk about going into the deep, We're talking about going in a place so deep with God that every conversation that we have, he's not out there somewhere, but he's right here with us. We need to be in such a place with God, so close and so deep to God. And I'm telling you, it's not only for the man of God to hear the voice of God. Yes, we need to be submitted. Please don't get me wrong. (laughs) Submitted to the word. Submitted to the fivefold, submitted to the man of God. We need to be submitted, absolutely. But it's not only for the man of God to hear the voice of God. It is also, if we're going to quote that verse, a chosen gener- generation, a royal priesthood, what did the priests have to do? <laughs> the priests didn't just follow the Ten Commandments. <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> The priesthood did not just do the bare minimum, (laughs) but the priesthood, you know that the priest, the high priest had a marriage requirement. He couldn't just marry anybody. Don't read too much into that. (laughs) Talk to pastor. (laughs) The priest had a garment requirement. He couldn't just go to that place however he wanted to. But if he wanted to go to that place, if he wanted to go to that place where the glory of God was, if he wanted to go to that (laughs) place. If we want to go to that place where the glory of God is, where the fullness of his glory is, If we want to go beyond the veil, it's going to require some consecration on our behalf. Beyond the veil. If we want to get to a place where we're not just experiencing God, but we can talk to him every day. And he's talking with us like he was with them in the garden in the cool of the day. That's so beautiful to me. I just picture Adam walking with God, (laughs) saying, God, how's your day today? (laughs) Well, this is what I did today. Oh, I ate this fruit today. It was really good. (laughs) And you might call me crazy (laughs) if I want to talk to God like that. (laughs) But I don't want to just get to a place in God where I'm content with just having light, (laughs) with just having provision, where I can just have a... (laughs) Expected prayer, the the norm. (laughs) 
But I want to get to a place in God <laughs> where I talk with him every day. Where when I'm, when I'm walking, God can say, turn left, and I turn. <laughs> to a place in God where he wants to walk beside me. These altars are open. <laughs> These altars are open. <laughs> and please understand my heart when I say this. This is a prayer that I pray to God every single day that I'm in His presence. I always pray, God, as I'm coming to you right now, I don't want, I don't want this to simply be emotions, Lord, but I need you. I need you, Lord, to search my heart. Yeah. I need you, Lord, to let me feel your heart be we we want to do the will of God. We want to say that will be done. We want to be in God's perfect will. But how can we do the will of God? How can we be the man or woman after God's own heart if we're not close enough to him to hear his heart beat? That's what it is to go beyond the veil. <laughs> That's what consecration will get us to. It's to get to a place where we will hear the heartbeat of God. 